Can you explain what mitochondria are and how to prevent mitochondrial decay? It gets back to this interesting phenomenon, contrary to way people thinking. There's not one best diet that reverses heart disease and another diet that's great for dementia, the dementia diet, another diet that's better for breast cancer, and another diet that's better for, you know, pancreatic cancer, another diet that's better for, you know, it's the same dietary portfolio that exposes you to the right amount of all these nutrients and the right amount may, may not be excessive amounts. So you could take too much vitamin D or too much vitamin K or too much of uh, vitamin E, you know, you could want to be in the right range of, of, of excellence, which is usually deficient is not bad and excess is not bad. You want to be in a sweet spot, for example. And so you and the same thing is true with what's the diet for your kidney? What's the right diet for your liver? What's the right diet for your mitochondria or your endoplasmic reticulum or your nucleus of your cell, your DNA? There's no such thing. It's what I'm saying to you is that um, the right foods seem to allow our body to age more slowly and protect all our organelles, all cellular surfaces and all organs and protect against this, all the diseases simultaneously. So if you're gonna be on a vegan diet and get yourself so your omega-3 index is one or two so low, it might have an effect on shrinking brain, but it'll reduce immune system function as well. It'll be, it'll be more irritating to your heart as well. It's not gonna only affect brain function that your omega-3 index. If your B12 is so low, it's not just gonna make your brain age faster. It's gonna make you, it's gonna raise homocysteine, which is gonna inflame the interior walls of your arteries and your legs, or and you hurt your nerves. So what I'm saying is that, that optimizing your nutrient intake is better for all parts of the body and protective against all diseases. So can you help explain what mitochondria is or what they are? Yeah, you know, and, and people also talk about the microbiome. Don't forget that. They say, oh, it's all about the microbiome, all about the bacteria in your gut. Mitochondria are the powerhouse of the cell where energy is made in the cell. And, it, it, and, and it's uh, because it functions and it's always being worked, it can age itself and be and have to be replaced. And that's okay. The body has the ability to replace cells that are aging and organelles that are aging. And we're saying with the right diet, the cell and the cell structure ages slowly. If it has to be replaced, your stem cells are activated. When cells become abnormal surfaces or, or they can be removed before they can become cancerous, the body has built-in checks and balances mm -hmm. that prevent anything, that prevents things from happening to us. We're a miraculous self-healing and self-repairing machine, but these self miraculous self healing mechanisms are only activated with a high exposure to vegetables and onions and what they're talking about these four foods that have the best effect on activating the you could say the mitochondria protective mechanisms and giving you micro diversity of the microbiome simultaneously and it's, there's two cooked foods in particular cooked mushrooms and cooked um, beans, cooked beans and cooked mushrooms. You have to cook beans very well. Beans should be soft, not, not, you know, hard, like a, like you make broccoli al dente. That's great, but don't, you got to cook beans a long time to get maximum nutrition effects. And we shouldn't be eating much raw mushrooms because they have a mild carcinogen called agarotene in most mushrooms. And there's still, you know, other substances that are better off cooked and you retain these longevity effects with cooked mushrooms. And the two raw foods are obviously, you know, the, the raw scallion or onion, very important for optimal health. And the second food, of course, is the green leafy vegetables, lettuce, kale, bok choy, cabbages, arugula, watercress, you can eat raw on your salad. And those are so incredibly lifespan promoting and beneficial to the, or to the mitochondria and the microbiome, particularly when you liquefy them in your mouth and you chew them really well because they liberate, they form the, these beneficial antioxidants and they form these isothiocyanides with their most protective effects to activate the NRF2 transcription proteins. They get their most protection when, the, when these beneficial nutrients are formed in the mouth. Because as the cell walls are crushed, the enzymes activate the formation of these beneficial compounds. If you don't chew very well and you kind of like swallow things halfway, you're gonna form not even one tenth the amount as you could concentrate on chewing. I'm saying be mindful when you eat your salad. My mantra is to eat at least one nice big salad a day. And then when you eat it, chew it super well to try to liquefy every mouthful in your mouth to get the full benefits out of it. And then the dressing 
something you put on it that has some nuts and seeds in there facilitates the absorption of those anti-cancer phytochemicals that makes it so protective. And the more and people say, well, can't you put in a blender to break down the vegetables and eat a green smoothie? Sure you could. But when you chew it, you get added benefits. It adds benefits to your jaw, your teeth, you mix with bacteria in the mouth, you form more nitric oxide. There's all kind of additional benefits from chewing a salad real well, including muscle strengthening and muscular endurance. So what I'm saying, eat the greens and chew them really well and, and eat raw greens every day and some cooked greens, but have that salad at least once a day. In our last interview, I remember, and this stuck with me, and I try to implement this in my life as well, and I've been seeing incredible benefits. Um, so a pound of leafy greens or a pound of raw vegetables, I should say, and a pound of cooked vegetables per day. Yeah, some guideline. They say, well, how much should I eat? And I'm not fixated on getting a pound. And if you're a small person, that's too much for you, then don't have that much. Yeah. But it's but a pound is, is like one tomato could weigh three quarters of a town. One tomato and one carrot could almost be a pound. One head of romaine lettuce could almost be a half a eight ounces. And one head of romaine lettuce and a tomato and some extra car raw carrots or raw beets or raw jicama or raw snow pea pods or raw could be, a, it's not that much food is a pound of food is not that much, you know? Sure. And then cooked vegetables. Well, think about it, you know, you know, like one eight ounce bag of, Frozen broccoli Florence is half a pound. My four-year-old daughter would eat that in nursery school. You know yeah. what I mean? So it's not, vegetables is not, uh, you know, two, that's one eight ounce serving, at least two servings of vegetables between cooked in your soup at lunch or in your, you know, your ditch. It doesn't, it's not that much food, even though it sounds like a lot of food a pound a pound. Yes. Most people, it's approximately the right amount of food, but some people may need a little more. Some people may need a little, little less, yeah. you know? I just don't want people to get fixated too much on the exactness of the precise amount. We shouldn't eat till, our full, till we're full. We should eat till we're satisfied, not full. And we should chew really well. And we shouldn't wake from the table, go up from the table with our stomach stretched out. We shouldn't be trying to force the food into us. You know what I mean? To just get all those nutrients in. Just eat what's comfortable and be hungry for the next meal. Mm -hmm. Err on the side of under eating just a hair. Don't err on the side of overeating. 